Good morning. We're glad to be with you this Sunday morning. We miss being together. Can't believe it's been almost three months plus since we've been uh, recording. Since the virus has hit, it's changed It's changed uh, everything in America, hasn't it? It's changed your life, changed our lives. We're all still having to adapt. Um, and God's given us real opportunities, all of us in our lives. Uh, I think he, maybe he's showing us different ways in which we can continue to serve the Lord and make a difference. Ministry out of the box, ministry out of our normal routine, uh, stretching us, challenging us. That's what God's doing. He always does that. In the end, he wants to use us. He wants to use you for his glory. He wants your life to touch the life of those around you. Maybe you can't get out. Maybe you're not getting out hardly at all. You can still touch people through prayer, through, through phone, through mail, through all different kinds of ways. Let God touch your heart. Well, I pray for you, and we, those of you who can't come, I know it's discouraging not being able to come out. And uh, we love you. We we'll pray the Word of God might just be reaching into your soul and, and refreshing you and encouraging you. We're in the Gospel of John. And I love, I love this testimony of Jesus Christ through the lens and through the eyes of John, showing us our Savior, the very Son of God, who is capable and sufficient for all that we might ever face, including right now. Last week we were in chapter 19, and we just finished up the narrative of the true account where Jesus simply gave up his life. He says, it is finished. He finished the work on the cross. He completed the work that, that, that God had given him to do there on the cross. In fact, we pick it up here in, in chapter 19, and Jesus says, when he had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he, and he bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit of his own power, of his own will, of his own time timing. He simply gave up his life. He let his life go. He laid it into the hands of his father, and he completed the work. It's hard to stay to the state of the past path and, and finish the course, and that's what Jesus Christ did. What an example, and how he enables us to do that. So we are in chapter 19, and we're simply seeing... Uh, now the disciples and the people around him respond to what has just happened. So we're going to pick that up this morning. We're going to see two, two themes come out of this text we're going to look at this morning here in 19. We're going to be in chapter 19, verses 31 through 42. We're going to see two things here that are, that are really encouraging. We see the power of God's word and we see the power of courage. So let's look at that together. Let's look first at the power of God's word. We pick it up here in verse 31. John, as he continues, he writes these words. Now, since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, and that they might be taken away. And so the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him on, him, on whom they have pierced. We see here, we see here uh, simply the power of the Word of God. Let's look at it. How, how does it exhibit its strength and its power in this text, in this narrative? It has all the way through. Jesus has delivered, given, and relied upon the Word of God. And now we see its power continue to have impact even after he has, he has laid down his life and given up his life before the Lord. It is, as we see in this passage, it's the day of preparation. That's what we see here. The whole narrative is being driven by by God's word. God, the crucifixion now is now laid right before, the, on this day of preparation, right before Passover, the, the, the feast of the unleavened bread, Passover together, this, this week-long festival, feast of worship takes place. Solemn worship before the Lord. What has happened is, is there has been a, a completely misguided religious zeal of the Jewish leaders who have driven Jesus Christ to the cross on the human scale. Because of their zealousness for the Old Testament, without a heart touched by the Spirit of God, without a heart touched by the grace of God, without a heart transformed by faith, they've been un unable to see that Jesus is the promise that all of the Old Testament has written about, the Messiah to come, the King to come. They've not been able to see that. And so it's the day of preparation. 
uh, the Sabbath begins tomorrow, which leads into, into Passover, and, and lambs are being slain in preparation before the Sabbath comes. Jesus is going to be crucified. In fact, it's, it's finished. Jesus Christ, as he says, it is finished. It's about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Sabbath is going to begin. It's, it's 6 p.m. So there's about three-hour time frame here. And so Jesus is being lifted up as Passover comes. The Jews would have understand uh, completely that lifted up is a reference to the crucifixion, the manner in which he would die. Not only that, we just see this, this uh, layover of Passover. Everything here in this picture is influenced by the reality that, it, that Passover is, is about to take place. Passover is, is a reminder. It takes every Jew who is there. And those who have given their faith uh, to God, those proselytes who have come in as well, it, it takes them all back to God's deliverance. Of Israel from Egypt when when Egypt was in captivity and were slaves to Egypt for 400 years and God did a miracle and he delivered them and so Passover is a reminder of deliverance and is a reminder of how God delivered them from Egypt and now and now this day here will be a, an eternal reminder of how God delivered man from sin from death those two Passover is is always meant to picture the cross it's always meant to be fulfilled in the cross and in Jesus Christ it has now been fulfilled Passover is, is a picture of judgment judgment would come upon all the firstborn of Egypt all the firstborn of those who would not who would not take the step that was required by faith to say I believe in God I trust in God the Jewish nation was called to take a step of faith it is judgment on Jesus he is the firstborn in the Mary and in 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 the family of Mary and Joseph, and he is the he is he is the only begotten Son before the Father, and so it is judgment upon Jesus Christ who became sin for us, who took our sin upon Himself. The Passover is is all about the Lamb, the Lamb that was to be sacrificed there at Passover by the Jews as they were preparing to leave Egypt. It is it is the sacrifice of the very Lamb of God who would fulfill all of those sacrifice requirements that were given in the Old Testament, he now fulfills those. And instead of them just being a covering for sin, he becomes the sacrifice for sin. It is all about blood. As that lamb was sacrificed and that blood was shed, then they were called to take that blood and put it on a hyssop branch and, and put it on the, on the door frame of their house. And so all the Jews, by, in faith, would have been putting those, those, that blood on the, on the, on the side post and on the, on, on the top of the door frame. Of course, it's a, it's a, intentional picture of the cross and Jesus his arms spread out in love and grace seeking the lost and here here is a, again reminder of Jesus Christ having fulfilled this this requirement this picture of the Passover the lamb of God's deliverance there is the angel of death that then came upon the land that evening as as Israel would be delivered from Egypt and everyone who had the blood on the doorpost would be protected because they had exhibited faith in God the same the same thing is true this angel of death, this, this sentence of death comes upon all mankind. And now Jesus Christ stands as our guardian, our protector. When we, when we give our, our faith and trust to Jesus Christ and confess him as our Savior and confess our sin before him and, and ask his forgiveness of our sin and step into relationship with Jesus Christ, we are protected from spiritual death. We are protected from the wrath of God, just as Israel was when they put that blood on the door frames. And it is, it is absolutely a step of faith. As Israel, Israelites and the Jews put that blood on those store frames at Passover here, as they were ready to leave Egypt, they were exhibiting faith in God. God, you are the only one who can deliver us. We believe. Jesus Christ has said here in the Gospel of John, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Jesus Christ here is, has lifted himself up as the only way to have a relationship with God. It is faith in him and him alone. In fact, John writes that the whole purpose of the Gospel of John is that we might believe that Jesus Christ is the very Son of God, and that by believing we might have life in the, in the name of Jesus Christ. That is the whole purpose of this book. And so, and so this picture here, this day of preparation, is as lambs are being slaughtered before the Sabbath comes, Jesus Christ has also been slaughtered as the very Lamb of God. What a picture that we see here. This is not coincidence. It is the beautiful prophetic fulfillment of the Word of God. That's what we see here. In fact, we pick it up in verse 36 of this chapter. 
we read that these things took place that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Everything that's happening here is going to take place so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. In verse 31, we see here this, that uh, the Jews implored and sought to move as quick as they could when Jesus died so that he would be taken down from the cross before the Sabbath came, so that the land wouldn't be, they wouldn't be unclean as they walked into the Sabbath. How ironic, huh? They were concerned about being clean and unclean, and yet they had just executed the very Son of God, the King of Kings. But Deuteronomy tells us, Deuteronomy tells us that um, the Word of God here is is simply this. It is chapter twenty one, verses twenty two and twenty three. There's not to be uh, anyone is not to hang on a tree, be impaled on a tree, hung on a tree, going into the Sabbath, for it defiles the land. We see that reality here. All these things had to take place. In verse 33, we have a reference to his bones not being broken. And so they come to Jesus. They come. They have been given a command to break the bones of, of the all the criminals. And they include Jesus in that. So that they might speed up the death. To break the bones of these men is to, is to quicken their death. Because they have to push up on those nails in their feet to breathe. And to break and then to break those those legs means they can no longer do that and they will asphyxiate and, and die. Remember, there's two criminals. One is an unbeliever. One has one has accepted Jesus Christ as Savior. His life is different, but he will die an agonizing death. And then he will step into paradise. Jesus Christ, he is already dead. His bone is not broken according to Scripture. Exodus chapter 12, verse 46. Numbers chapter 9, verse 12. Psalm chapter 34, 34, verse 20, all show us this, this prophetic promise that his bones would not be broken. The lamb that was sacrificed at Passover when the Egyptians fled Egypt, God commanded those lambs who were sacrificed that the bones of those lambs would not be broken because it pictured the very, the very fulfillment of Jesus Christ here on the cross. We also see that he was pierced. He did... We, Verse 34, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and out came blood and water. And there's been a lot written about the blood and water. Tried to make it a typology or, or how it's fulfilled somehow spiritually. It simply is blood and water. There's been medical elements brought into the picture as to what was pierced, a, a, a sack around the heart, whatever. But what it signifies is this, because John highlights this. Um, he says in verse 36, he who has borne witness, his testimony is true. He knows he's telling the truth. The truth is this, is that Jesus is dead. And when they pierce that, that blood and water is already separated in his, in his organs. And, and it comes out separate because it's, it's the body fluids and the body's not functioning anymore. He is dead. And it is a reality. that So the Roman soldier pierces him. In verse 34, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, which is, which is fulfilled in, Re in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. John chapter 20, verse 20, shows the, the prophetic word of Jesus Christ being pierced. It's interesting. They came with the command. They came to break his legs. That was the command given to them, to speed up death. They come, and he's already dead. They break the legs of the two thieves. They don't break the legs of, of Jesus. They broke the command here. They were given a command. They had no intention of piercing him, simply to break his legs. A soldier decides... I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pierce him with a, with this with this spear, and so out of the blue he does that, and so they came with the purpose of breaking his legs and don't do it. They don't come with the purpose of of mutilating his body with a spear, and yet that's exactly what they did. How amazing that that so many years before prophecy was written that Jesus Christ would die, his legs would not be broken, but his side would be pierced. How amazing. You know, the fulfillment of Scripture is directly tied to the promises of God. See, prophecy is promise. 2 Corinthians 1.20 We have to believe, as we look at the promises of God, we believe that God is faithful. All the promises of God find their yes, find their fulfillment in Him. That is why it is through Him that we utter our amen to God. For His glory, all the promises of God are yeses. When he promises, it will be a yes. He will fulfill. He has fulfilled his word. He will fulfill his word. When we look to the promises of God, we are, we are putting our faith in the completed work of Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 24. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things, enter into his glory, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, 
he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He was the fulfillment of everything that was laid out in the word of God. We believe when we look to the promises of God that God is faithful. Not just faithful, but you know what? We're called to believe that he's faithful to me, to you, to each one of us. Romans chapter 4, we're to be fully convinced that God is able to do what he promised. That's, that's Abraham. Abraham was fully convinced that God was able to do what God had promised him as an individual. We're called to have that faith in, in Jesus Christ, that he has given promises to us as individuals, and we're to live and breathe and act and function upon those promises. We're to believe, as we look to the promises of God, that no matter what the cost, you know what, it's going to be worth it all. We see here in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17, for Abraham again, he was tested. And when he was tested, he was tested by offering up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the very act of offering up his son. Abraham was willing, no matter the cost, to stay true to God. That his identity might be in Christ. We talked about that last week. That his identity was, was God himself. That whatever God required, he was willing to do because God had been so faithful. Because, because God was one he understood was, was bigger than him in ways he could never, ever comprehend. And that God was one who could be trusted with his promises. And Abraham trusted him. As we look to the promises of God, we are basically saying this, Lord, I believe you. And I believe you one moment at a time, every day. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Every day we waver just a little bit. And we need to stand strong and, and in faith say, God, just keep me, keep me solid, keep me strong, keep me grounded in the promises of your word. Keep me focused on you that I may never waver, that I may not waver even just a little bit. Because when I waver a little bit, then I waver a little bit more. And I find myself pivoting away from God's will and I'm pivoting away from God's heart. And I find myself doing and saying and thinking in manners that, that never would honor Christ. And so when I, when I look to the Word of God and I stand on His Word, I'm standing on His promises, and I, and I do that every moment of every day. When we stand on the promises of God, we are called uh, to enduring obedience every day, every step. Hebrews chapter 10, the author says, You have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. He calls us to obedience, God does. He calls us to endure. He calls us, reminds us that there are promises that are ours. But, but until we have all of those promises fulfilled, until all of those things are, are realized in our life, we're called to endure obediently. We're not, we're not called to live a life of disobedience. We're not to wake up and choose to do what would hurt and break God's heart. When we get up and say, I'm going to do it my way. When we get up and say, I'm not going to open my Bible today. When we get up and say, I'm too tired to pray. I'm too busy to pray. I'm not going to church today. I don't want to be with God's people this week. We are stepping away from the very resources, the very foundation, the very, the very things that we need to keep us on task so that we might honor God's name and receive ultimately the greatest blessing in our life. Because when we when we believe in his promises, we're ultimately believing in a reward that's coming to us that is far greater than we can comprehend. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 3, According to his promise, we are waiting for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. We're going to be right with God fully, and we're going to want to be right with God. And we're going to, and we're going to, we're going to have, in, the, in a moment, we're going to have shame for all those moments we've wasted that we never used for the Lord. When we have in our possession everything that God has ever will ever give us and the fullness of God's promises, I don't want to look back and say I've wasted so much time before the Lord. May God call us to, to look ahead always. May God call you this morning to look ahead to his word. You know what? I want you to consider and to write down and, and keep in front of you God's promises, God's blessings, God's eternal reward. May it motivate your faithfulness, your enduring obedience before the Lord. We see the power of, of God's word, the power of scripture being fulfilled. But we also see the power of courage. Let's look at that. And after these things, verse, verse 38, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and he took away his body. And Nicodemus also, 
who earlier had come to Jesus by night. In fact, every time Nicodemus is mentioned in the Gospel of John, he is mentioned as the one who came to Jesus by night. And he came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. That's a, that's a lot of, of spices. And so they took the body of Jesus and bound, and bound him in linen cloths with the spices, as it is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had been let, yet been laid. And so because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. We are reminded in John 12 how there were many who received, who believed in Christ. Many even of the authorities of, of the religious leaders believed. But for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it. They didn't want to be put out of the synagogue. They didn't want to lose. They loved all that they had rather than giving it up for Christ. That was a reality here. There's a warning that we're given in Scripture, Matthew 10. Everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. What a, oh my goodness. What a, what a, what, what a beautiful thing to stand before the Father and have Jesus call our name and acknowledge us in relationship. Don't you want that this morning? I want that more than anything else. Whoever denies me before men, I will deny before my Father who is in heaven. No relationship. But here's the thing. Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus, secret believers. It says here specifically, specifically of Joseph, he was a secret disciple of Jesus Christ. Nicodemus, we don't know for sure. But, the, you know, he came at night. Many have said he came out of fear, and it's quite possible he did. There may be other reasons by, in which he came that night, but it's always this phrase is always associated to him. And yet here's the thing. Here's the thing. Isaiah tells us, and they made the grave, the grave of Jesus, they made his grave with the wicked, but with a rich man in his death. We see the fulfillment of Scripture here. Here's what we see. We see two men potentially afraid to be public about identity with Jesus Christ. Both, both involved as leaders in Israel are going to see that and afraid of losing everything. And yet we see them take a courageous act of love. The death of Jesus Christ is going to transform them, it seems. We have a, the prophecy, which is transformative in their life. Prophecy that we just read from Isaiah and now it's coming to life in Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. Joseph is, in verse 38, he's a secret disciple. He is, uh, he's now bold <clears throat> at last. He's, he, it, he, is, he has been in secret, and now it's, now it's daytime. It's 3 o'clock. Sabbath doesn't come till 6. You've got these three hours. It's, it's now light time out, and he comes forward publicly, and he takes steps here to acquire the body of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 25, verse 47, he was rich. He was a rich man. He was a disciple of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 15, verse 43, he is a respected member of the council, this, this religious ruling body. Luke chapter 23, verses 50 to 51, he is a good man. He is a righteous man. Now this is John writing this, the inspiration of Scripture. Not a perfect man, not a sinless man. He's a good man. He's a righteous man, which indicates here that maybe that he has relationship with Christ. He did not, we're told here in Luke 23, he did not consent to the death of Jesus Christ. Maybe he didn't say it verbally. Maybe he was silent. We don't know. He says he was secretly a disciple. Maybe he just didn't say a thing. But, but God knew his heart, and God revealed that to John. Maybe he communicated that to John somehow. And he was looking for the kingdom of God, we're told here in Luke chapter 23. His eyes were on Christ, but he was afraid. The Bible says a lot about, about believers were to, were to be bold for Christ, were to be ambassadors for Christ. Ultimately, there's no place for a believer who, who proclaims the names of Jesus Christ and then never is public about that testimony. Jesus will say to that individual when they stand before him, I never knew you, ever. If we know Jesus Christ, it will be revealed in our life. If there is a genuine relationship, it will be revealed. You will be bold in your family before your children, before your, before your parents, before your grandparents, before the people you know and love, before your peers and your friends and people you work. Ultimately, Jesus Christ will come out in your life. It is a requirement and a necessity of a genuine faith. 
because of the transformative work of the Word of God and the Spirit of God. We have Nicodemus in verse 39 through 42. He comes, he takes, he prepares the body of Jesus, he buries it. John chapter 3, verse 1, he's, we're told he's a Pharisee. Pharisees are keepers of the law, that everyone in Israel keeps the law. They're legalists. He is a ruler of the Jews, John chapter 3. He comes to Jesus by night. He's challenged to be born again, as we see in the Greek there, to be born from above, to be born from, from God. John chapter 7, the, the members of the Sanhedrin, of which he is a member of, that's the ruling body, they try to arrest Jesus Christ, to condemn him. They're unsuccessful. They're not able to do that. Nicodemus says, we need to listen to him first. He's not listened to. We have these two men here. We have these two men. And so they come and they take away the body of Jesus. The Jews asked Pilate to uh, the Jews have asked Pilate to to break their legs. Nicodemus and, and Joseph asked Pilate to take their body. I wonder if they're there at the same time. You see, it says here both they were secret believers. It's quite possible maybe they came as a group to perform Pilate. And if they did, now it's now it's clear that they are followers of Jesus Christ. Now they themselves are at risk of the, of the condemnation of the pursuit of these religious leaders of the Sanhedrin. They've already put out wanted posters, as it were, for the disciples, for Jesus Christ. They've been looking for Jesus Christ and anyone associated with him. Now Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus have just put a mark on their back. They've come to Pilate, so have the Jewish leaders. Did they come together? I'm sure they were aware of what was going on. Maybe they wouldn't, didn't. Maybe the Jewish leaders came first. But haste is important. Urgency is important. That is the key thing here. And they come and they take him. And, and it says um, they bring a mixture of myrrh and aloe, about 75 pounds. They came prepared. They were already prepared. They didn't go out and buy all these things after Jesus died. See, this is all premeditated. There is faith built in here. There is, there is something positive in their heart that's, that's being revealed. There is a tomb. It is Joseph of Arimathea's. It is his tomb. It is new. It's never been used. Did he, have it, did he have it hewn? Did he have it made just for Jesus Christ, even though it belongs to him? In faith, did he have this tomb made just for Jesus Christ? We don't know. It doesn't answer that. Did he make it for him and then decide to give it to Jesus Christ? We don't know. But it had been done before the crucifixion. Anticipation, right? And they bring, they bring all these spices, and they're prepared, and they bring these together, and they, and they wrap the body of Jesus Christ in linen, and they anoint his body, and the linen would have been, would have been soaked with all these spices and, and ointments, and they would have prepared the body of Jesus Christ and, and, and laid it down. So they've got three hours to get the body off of the cross. That's why the Jews asked Pilate to, to, to expedite the death of everyone on the cross. So they don't want to be defiled. Again, so ironic. They asked Pilate to break their legs. Joseph and Nicodemus come in and ask for the body of, of Jesus Christ. Normally, normally the Romans would allow the bodies to stay on the cross, to rot, to be a warning to anyone passing by. Remember, there would usually be something written up about their offense or what kind of criminal they were. Linen cloth, unused tomb. The, the, the stone is then rolled across the tomb. We're told in the other accounts of the Gospels that the, that the women are with them. They see where Jesus is laid. They see how he is, he is wrapped. They're there. They don't touch him. It seems like it's the men that do this after his death. Because here's the beauty. Through all of this, Jesus Christ is fulfilling Scripture. He's transforming lives. That's what he's doing. As these two men step forward publicly, their lives have been transformed. The death of Jesus Christ has transformed them. We don't know anything about these two men. They're not mentioned again. What kind of walk they had, what kind of life they had. But it appears from the word, because they're included in such a way that they have been transformed by Jesus Christ. And in faith they step out. With boldness they step out. We're reminded in Psalm 31. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. All of you who wait for the Lord. As we look ahead... You know, this is the reminder. Encouragement, hope, strength, we find it in Christ. Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus, it's, it appears their life was transformed. 
in faith, they gave their very best. They stepped forward into the light when there was still great risk upon their own lives for identifying with Jesus Christ. They take the body of Jesus Christ down and they lay him in a tomb. Now they are marked men. And we're told nothing else. But there is courage, a courage that is infused into their soul and into their life. It enables faith. When we let God feed our soul, we let faith transform our life. Our souls are fed by the grace of God. Courage, courage by the Spirit of God floods into our life. And we're able to stand. We're able to, to obediently endure, to stay the course. God takes two individuals here who are fearful and infuses them with courage. And he uses them examples. Where are the other disciples? Where are the other 11? John is here. Where's the others? Where are they? Why are they not here doing this? You know, what boldness, really, of these two men. But ultimately, it's about Jesus Christ, the work of God, birth, birthing faith in these men. That's what happens. My prayer is this, that God will just infuse you with courage this week and, and just light within you the power of grace, that you'll stand for Christ, that you'll be faithful to him. I want to thank you for joining us. Thank you for coming this week. I want, to, I want to mention here, we're not going to meet on video this next Sunday. We're going to have a guest speaker. Odier is going, to, Odier is going to be with us. So it won't be online. So we'll be back in two weeks. We invite you to come back then. Thank you for joining with us. And again, may the courage of the Lord speak into your life and into your soul and fill you with, uh, with just the joy of the Lord as we look ahead to the promises that one day will be ours. May God bless you and encourage you. Thanks for joining.